following lecture by Dr. Gordon H. Clark is entitled Religious Experientialism and Irrationalism. I think I made rather clear the uh, purpose of the course and what it was to contain that uh, the defense of Christianity must be systematic and uh, in order to meet other systems. We have spent the time so far chiefly in uh, arguing against all forms of empiricism. Now the empirical apologists <coughs> do wish to be systematic to a certain extent and they also at least when occasion arises uh, attempt to answer questions from science as I gave you a little example on the board last time and they may have some notions of historiography and uh, psychology and so on. Uh, now then, there are, there are religious views, I won't call them Christian views, but at any rate, religious views that sometimes claim to be Christian which uh, would reject both a priorism, which I defend, and also empiricism, which I do not defend, as you found out, but who uh, reject the whole notion of system. And so for today, and maybe tomorrow, I want to talk about this other view, which we have not discussed yet. John E. Smith, professor of philosophy at Yale University, <coughs> is farther removed from Schleiermacher and is even violently, well, very vigorously, opposed to sensory empiricism. I hope you have read enough about Schleiermacher to understand a reference to him. Schleiermacher is the father of modernism as it captured the main bodies of Christianity here in this country from uh, well it was in, it was being introduced before World War I and it continued <coughs> until about the end roughly or to the beginning or the end of World War II a system of religion that was commonly called modernism. This was based on Schleiermacher. But Schleiermacher's experience was a religious experience, the feeling of complete dependence. Now, uh, John E. Smith is farther removed from Schleiermacher and is vigorously opposed to, more vigorously than Schleiermacher was, to sensory experience. For both these reasons, he is a good example of non-Humean empiricists. It is essential, of course, to explain what he means by experience. Smith begins his rejection of the early empiricism with the sentence, quote, It is often said by theologians that an analysis starting with the universal fact of religion involves us in the morass of subjectivity and forces us to depend entirely upon human experience. They are too willing to accept an outmoded conception of what it experience is and means. The philosophical standpoint required for this task is that of radical empiricism, making central the doctrine that experience is an objective and critical product of the intersection between reality in all its aspects on the one hand and a self-conscious being capable of receiving that reality through significant form on the other. Despite much talk of empiricism in modern philosophy, 
actual experience in its full range and depth has frequently been ignored. End of quote. And of course, I've omitted a few sentences here and there, as you see with the three dots. And uh, you can uh, find it in Experience in God on page 11, where he is giving his introductory explanation of how he's going to proceed. From the time of Aristotle to the present, the term experience has indeed been used to designate a full range and depth of the intersection between reality and a self-conscious being. One must not quarrel about this linguistic usage. You, know, you can use those words if you want. But uh, Aristotle spoke of experienced carpenters. You know, if you go out to get a job, they ask you, have you had any experience? And you ask, yes, I saw the color blue on my way here this morning. They wouldn't understand your answer. They're using the word experience in a totally different sense. And this was Aristotle's sense. <clears throat> Aristotle spoke of experienced carpenters, experienced musicians. The trouble, however, lies in explaining how such people became experienced. They were not born that way. They had to practice. They had to begin with something much more simple than experience in this sense of the term. Therefore, if one is an empiricist, there must be an experience otherwise defined. Smith speaks of a critical product of the intersection between reality in all its aspects on the one hand and a self-conscious being capable of receiving that reality. Nice sentence, isn't it? How is such a being capable? What is the method of receptivity? Is there any evidence of a reality that can intersect with a self-conscious being? What does intersection mean? A philosopher like Smith a philosopher who claims that other philosophers have ignored the full range of experience should not ignore the problem of explaining how a critical product can be produced. Smith ignores the problem of explanation. He does not ignore the early empiricism that made a brave attempt. Only he does not think the attempt brave or successful. Quote, there have been, for example, narrow theories of experience that would confine it to data supposedly disclosed through the senses, atomic data exclusive of relations. The chief obstacle, the obstacles that have hindered the development of an adequate theory of experience in modern philosophy are these. First, Many philosophers have assumed that experience is a mental product in the consciousness of the individual, pages 22 and 23. Now, that isn't his only objection. This is his first objection, you see. That's his, he says it's the chief obstacle, or others. So the chief obstacle, the chief obstacles that have hindered the development of an adequate theory of experience is that experience is supposed to be mental and individual. <coughs> Yet, <coughs> Smith himself posited a self-conscious, receptive being. Is not even the full range and depth of a carpenter's experience mental, <coughs> conscious, and indeed subjective? How much more subjective must be the experiences out of which the carpenter critically constructs his product? Therefore, must not a careful thinker reject as plainly false Smith's assertion that, quote, in the most basic sense, experience is a many-sided product of complex encounters between what there is and a being capable of responding to and expressing it. 
Let me read that sentence again and try to, you try to think about it. And because of what was said in the preceding paragraphs, I suggest that a careful thinker reject Smith's assertion as false. And the assertion is this. In the most basic sense, not in some developed sense like an experienced carpenter, but in the most basic sense, experience is a many-sided product. Well, if it's basic, how can it be a product of anything? Well, I'll read the sentence. In the most basic sense, experience is a many-sided product of complex encounters between what there is and a being capable of responding and expressing it. Surely this cannot be the most basic sense of experience. Encounters in the plural cannot be more, um, more basic than the first encounter in the singular. There must be something that precedes the critical product. Must not the self-conscious being respond to this more elementary X. And if it is the response of a self-conscious being, must not the experience be mental? Now, I hope next week there will be time enough for me to discuss behaviorism with you to a certain extent, where there is a more determined attempt to deny that experience is mental. Uh, the behaviorists, of course, say there is no such thing as consciousness, no such thing as anything mental, and it's all physics and chemistry, and I want to take that up. I must save a day or two for that. And without such a mental event, how can the responding receptive being learn what is there? But no, <coughs> quote, the chief error of taking experience as mental or subjective consists in the uncritical assumption that experience is a record or report to be found entirely within the mind. <coughs> Smith rejects this because it leads to subjective idealism and therefore to skepticism. Since this result makes him feel uncomfortable, he refuses to explain how a non-mental experience can teach a conscious being that there is an external reality. Furthermore, if experience is a product of two factors, a stone and a person, then each equally has the experience. The experience belongs to the stone quite as much as it belongs to the person. Then, and he admits that, of course, and then I ask a question, then is the stone also a self-conscious being? If it has experience, doesn't it, isn't it a self-conscious being? Didn't he say that before? If, on the other hand, the experience does not belong to both in the same way, the person must have something the stone does not have. And is not this something a subjective mental experience that leads the person to think that what he sees is a stone? <clears throat> Indeed, Smith cannot avoid these embarrassments. He acknowledges that, and you note the quotes, I don't like to say quote unquote all the time, and you have it printed in front of you, so I am. He acknowledges that experience is much more than a reflection or mirror image of what is encountered. The one who experiences refracts as well as reflects. The total nature of the being who experiences enters into the transaction, which means that the being is not simply a theoretical knower but does not refraction indicate that the person alters what is there 
and therefore does not receive it as it is. Such a theory results in a reality that is unknowable and an experience that is unjustifiable. What is true of so-called experience of a stone is even more obviously true of religious experience. Smith introduced his basic definition of a rich and varied experience for the purpose of defending God and religion from scientism, mechanism, and irreligion. But once again, it is impossible to derive any positive religion from the religious dimension of experience. This leaves unsupported not so much his denial that Christianity is final and exhaustive as his assertion that Buddhism and Hinduism contain <clears throat> true revelations from God. One would like to see a detailed step-by-step -step account of how experience justifies this or that truth in Hinduism. I want to emphasize step-by-step -step the details and the general, probably sometimes you must need general or universal proposition, but you must work it out step by step. It is to use an example. You know I like to play chess, and I'll play chess with any of you. It'll bring a board and men around. Just get me, and I'll play. Uh, but uh, suppose I were giving some lessons to someone in chess. Well, I should say you must control the center of the board and make your pieces interact with each other and give you something like that. Now, that isn't teaching a person how to play chess. Those statements are true, but they mean very little. I must tell you precisely what piece to move from where to where. And you must know the, you must know the exact openings for the first ten moves. As many as you can. I have a book on openings. It's about 250 pages. Each page has five columns of openings, and each column has about 15, 12 or 15 moves of it. And so if you take five, five columns on one page and multiply that by 250, you will see how many openings there are in the book. And then each of one goes 12 to 15 moves. That's learning chess. Of course, uh, uh, Bobby Fischer just was born knowing it all. He didn't have to study it. I, just innate with Fisher, but our, our innate knowledge doesn't quite equal that of Bobby Fisher's. One would like to see a detailed step-by-step -step account of how experience justifies this or that truth in Hinduism. If the alleged truth is definite, even the author admits the gap. But if the truth is vague enough to be found in some form in all three religions, then God is the common characteristic of Jehovah, Shiva, and Nirvana. And this is nothing at all, as I tried to show you in the first chapter of the 3R book. These considerations ruin some 20 pages of non-Chalcedonian Christology, as well as the assumption underlying a discussion of the book of Job. So far as the present writer can see, the best the author does with this situation is to appeal to a living reason that depends on convincing conversation, which by the canons of logic is fallacious. So you must use fallacies to defend your religion. Such fallacious living reason can develop the content of experience in any direction it wishes. Christianity, liberal or orthodox, Buddhism and Hinduism follow equally well. <clears throat> now as for the rest, the thing to do for you if you are interested, and I don't think you can do it this coming week, but you might try, is to get, uh, is to get Smith's book and uh, read it and compare with what I say on these three pages and come to your own conclusion. 
but <laughs> this this is the core of my refutation of that form of empiricism which depends on religious experience and uh, doesn't have much to do with sensory experience. Now, as I said at the beginning of the hour, I want to go on to those uh, empiricists. Well, they're really not. They, well, in a sense, they are empiricists. But uh, those who reject the notion of systematic apologetics. They don't like logic. They don't like system and so on. <clears throat> As you know, modernism is almost extinct. Now, I know some seminaries uh, that are still, well, well, anyhow, I know professors in seminaries. The professors are still thoroughgoing modernists. I played chess with one for 30 years. I know precisely what he thought, not only about chess, but other things too. And his seminary was basically modernistic, although this irrationalism was creeping into it at the time. And there are a few others, I suppose, who are still modernists. But the uh, main religious movement of the present day is irrationalism. And uh, this has taken over most of the seminaries, and uh, that's what I want to discuss. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard and Karl Marx, the two of them, were both students of Hegel. I wish I had time to explain Hegel more at length, but that would require an hour or two. Maybe I can add a few little things as we go on. You'll have to sort of guess at it. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you want to get an elementary account of Hegel, you can read my very elementary book with the title Thales to Dewey and read the chapter on Hegel. And if you think it's difficult, you read Hegel and then you'll think what I wrote is very easy. In addition to a little pomposity and a semblance of omniscience, there was a definite point at which the anti-Hegelian reaction, Feuerbach and Marx as well as Kierkegaard, a definite point at which the anti-Hegelian reaction took aim. It was the existence of the individual. Uh, this uh, this uh, occupied the attention of German philosophy for quite a period of time in the 19th century. There is a uh, there is a volume. Oh, it's, uh, the the title of the volume is. Uh, I think it's von, von Hegel bis Nietzsche. From Hegel to Nietzsche. It's an account of German philosophy in the 19th century. And the author's name is, he was a professor in Heidelberg. And I attended Heidelberg University, but of course I can't remember his name. I didn't attend his class. In it. I'll think of it this afternoon sometime. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, this very interesting book, uh, describes in detail the theories of individuality that were uh, pro, uh, promulgated uh, during the uh, 19th century, individualism of a certain type, and uh, it was very interesting. Kierkegaard uh, was one of them. Marx was not one of them. Marx is an anti-individualist. Feuerbach and Marx are socialists, communists. Kierkegaard was an individualist. Uh, they were both, uh, the foyer, uh, Marx and Kierkegaard were both students of Hegel. I have tried to find out whether they were in class together, but I've not been able to dig up that information. It is, of course, quite possible, and I might even say probable, 
that they did not meet as students. Uh, after all, a professor teaches for quite a number of years, and students come and go, and I would suspect that Kierkegaard perhaps was a later student of Hegel some years later. Marx was earlier, but I don't know. <clears throat> well, all right. <clears throat> In addition to pomposity and omniscience, uh, Feuer, Bach, Marx, and Kierkegaard took aim at his rejection of the individual. The, they, they aimed at his denial of the existence of the individual. When Hegel attempted to deduce Kant's inexplicable given, and of course Hegel rejected the idea of anything given, and he annihilated uh, Kant, There's, he showed very clearly that there is nothing given, uh, when Hegel attempted to deduce Kant's inexplicable given, namely the data, the things given, data means givens of sensation, he analyzed one concept after another, arranging them in a cohesive system, a word his opponent spelled with a capital S in derision. Such a system of concepts <coughs> is a system of universals. Admittedly, the concepts of being, quality, cause, and so on are universals. And may I interrupt uh, and uh, remark to you, I hope you have perceived that uh, my apologetics has no abstract concepts in it. I don't agree with Plato or with Hegel in making concepts basic. I make propositions basic. And Hegel took some time to object the propositions and uh, denounce them as uh, mistaken. <clears throat> and uh, you will find some of this in Thales to Dewey a little bit, where I try to defend the reality of propositions against the reality of concepts. And again, I will point out to you that St. Augustine uh, rejected abstract concepts and had only propositions. Well, uh, there's a lot behind this that you can't give us class in three weeks. We ought to have three years. Then we could go over it a little more carefully. Yes, Roy? Yes. Uh, I think I have done this before, but I'll do it again. The, the usual explanation is, I say usual because there's one exception. The usual explanation is that you start with sensory data. You have the, these data produce images and then you collect certain images and in a very mysterious way produce an abstract concept. I say in a mysterious way because Aristotle really doesn't explain the process. I told you before that he uses an illustration. He says it's like an army that is disorganized and in route. And then one soldier makes a stand, that's supposed to be one image, and another soldier makes a stand, and another soldier makes a stand, and then as that goes on, the whole army is again organized. Now, I sometimes use illustrations to wake the students up, but I don't depend on illustrations, and the illustrations, since they are illustrations, are not what you're talking about. The illustrations are supposed to refer to what you're talking about, so it's not the same thing, and they can always be misunderstood. That's what, but it does wake the class up sometimes. And uh, Aristotle doesn't give any explanation. He just uses this illustration. And without an explanation, I have nothing to, to report except what he said. And uh, so <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, no, uh, Locke, does, Locke does something better, but uh, he... Uh, 
he got uh, he got himself in a jam that I can't go through all the history of 18th century British philosophy. You know. Now, for uh, for Hegel, uh, Hegel didn't uh, do it quite that way. Uh, he uh, sort of gave a preliminary survey and started with the concept which was both most universal and most empty. That's the concept of being. And then by a dialectical process, which is the concept of being turns into its contradictory, and then a third concept merges the two contradictories. And having merged the two contradictories, it develops its contradictory, and then the next concept will merge those two, and so on, until you get to a top concept, which is also all-inclusive, but explicitly inclusive, whereas the first concept was implicitly exclusive. Well, that's a very short and brief picture of Hegel's theory. But in this dialectical process, uh, there is no individual. The, admittedly, the concepts of being, quality, cause, and so on, uh, Hegel has about 200 concepts which he has arranged in his system. Uh, Kant only had uh, 12 concepts, you know. Such a concept is a system of universals, like being, quality, and cause. So also are the concepts life, motion, soul, and reason, all of which are in Hegel's list of some 200 categories. But, objected his opponents, there is no motion in the concept of motion. My pen, with which the obscure Herr Kruch challenged the great professor, my pen cannot <coughs> be deduced from the concept of thing. And more important, I myself cannot be found in life or reason. Individuals, both things and persons, do not occur in the system. Hegel could not explain himself. Maybe the system had a place for the philosopher, but Hegel himself, Descartes, and Aristotle were absent. Many people regard this circumstance as fatal to rationalism. Kierkegaard had a further reason for reacting against empty universals. He was a Christian. At least he talked as he thought Christians ought to talk. And since Christianity offers eternal salvation to human individuals, individuals are important in the extreme. Whether the philosopher succeeds or fails in properly arranging the concepts of being and life as a trivial matter. But whether I myself, just this one individual person, me, attains heaven is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. There are also other individuals that strike Kierkegaard's attention, though with a different result, namely, individual historical events. I might interject here, it's strange that Kierkegaard was so much interested in human individuals, he was not interested in individual historical events. Though if they are individuals, he ought to have been very happy about them, but we'll see what he says. <clears throat> he had a different view of individual historical events. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> If Herr Krug's pen was sufficiently pointed to puncture Hegel's pomposity, <clears throat> one would think that existentialism, concerned as it is for individual existences, would show some interest in individual events. Is not Napoleon more important to an historian than a pen? And must not a Christian take an interest in Jesus of Nazareth? Through the centuries, Christianity has taught 
that Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate on the third day, that's the 14th of Nisan, rose from the dead on the 16th of Nisan. These are dated historical individual events. But, strangely, Kierkegaard is completely uninterested. He asks in italics, is an historical point of departure possible for an eternal consciousness? And I have a footnote on that that you can read and think about after a while. Is an historical point of departure possible for an eternal consciousness? How can such a point of departure have any other than a mere historical interest? Is it possible to base an eternal happiness upon historical knowledge? Of course, his answer is no. <clears throat> and this is put on the title page as a sort of a, of a motto for the whole book. Traditional apologetics and theological prolegomena use these events to prove the truth of Christianity or use various historical evidences to prove the truth of these events. <clears throat> but Kierkegaard will not raise the question of the truth of Christianity, nor is he interested in the systematic zeal of the personally indifferent individual to arrange the truths of Christianity in paragraphs. Remember I said just a few minutes ago before I began reading that there was a form of empiricism that rejected system. And Kierkegaard is the most obvious example, the best known example of that reaction. He wants to deny system. He doesn't, he's not interested in uh, historical events and not interested in systematic zeal and in different paragraphs. What Kierkegaard will discuss is the concern of the infinitely interested individual for his own relationship to such a doctrine. One reason for ignoring the truth of Christianity is the impossibility of discovering what happened in history. History is an empirical study, and empiricism makes knowledge impossible. Did Christ die and rise? Was there ever a preacher in Palestine named Jesus? Can we discover anything he ever said or did? Historical investigation to determine these facts requires a study of documents. Are the documents genuine or not? Did Matthew copy Mark's mistakes? Was John written after A.D. 150? How shall opposing evidences be judged? Judge they must be. They must be balanced, the ones against the others. Newly discovered evidence changes the balance. Historical study, therefore, results in a series of approximations, and approximations lead to despair, for no one ever gets to heaven by approximations. There's a footnote on Martin Kaler here. <clears throat> Martin Kaler wrote a very brilliant thesis, uh, whose title I forget, of course, <clears throat> He lived, he wrote about 1890 and actually brought the Life of Jesus movement to an end. The Life of Jesus movement began with Bauer and, uh, what's his sidekick? Bauer and, uh, hmm? Strauss. Who? Strauss. Strauss, yeah, that's right, Strauss and Bauer. <coughs> uh, went through, uh, say, um, uh, Renan in France and uh, came to an end with uh, the fellow who concluded Christ was insane. The fellow who plays the organ. Schweitzer, yeah. Quest of this. <clears throat> he showed that Christ was insane. And uh, that, uh, that brought to an end uh, the life of Jesus movement. <clears throat> but Kaler brings it to a philosophic end 
not simply to an absurd conclusion. And uh, you, you ought to read that, that thing by Kaler uh, to show that uh, faith has nothing to do with history. And uh, it's a very brilliant thesis. And, of course, it will help you understand the developments in American seminaries in the uh, past uh, 50 years. <laughs> it takes about 50 years for a German scholarship to get over here to America. So uh, Kaler became popular here, oh, in the late 30s, certainly, well, yeah, I say the late 30s or something like that. More, more popular, I suppose, after World War II. <coughs> But uh, he, he wrote about 1890 or 1898 or somewhere along there. <clears throat> but approximations lead to despair. Scholarship never ends. Therefore, the scholar can never decide. One can admire Ciceronian scholarship because it aims at nothing more than accuracy about Cicero. Here, approximation is not embarrassing, but biblical scholarship used to establish the truth of historical events claims to give eternal life. This, unlike Cicero, is a matter of infinite passion, and for infinite passion and eternal life, a single iota is of infinite importance. And there's a footnote that questions whether the iota that he's referring to is the, the letter which changes homoousius into homoousius. I don't know whether that's so or not. It's just a guess on my part. <clears throat> Suppose historical research proved the Bible true. Would this help anyone who did not have faith? No. For faith is not the result of scholarly inquiry. It does not bring a person one step closer to faith. Would such proof of the biblical events <clears throat> help the person who already has faith? No, for several reasons. First, since he has faith, nothing further is needed. Second, <clears throat> research may actually harm him <clears throat> because objectivity tends to dissipate uh, infinite passion. Then third, according to this supposition, the person would know that the Bible is true, he would have knowledge, and therefore he would have lost his faith. Faith requires passion, and certainty excludes passion. <clears throat> faith does not need theology or scholarship for the same reason that a girl in love does not need to have a respectable boyfriend. And there's a footnote on that too. <clears throat> At the start, <clears throat> one might have uh, thought that Kierkegaard <clears throat> would be interested in history simply because Hegel was not. <clears throat> if there is no motion in the concept of motion and no Hegel in the concept of man, does it not follow that the absolute has no place for history? But by Kierkegaard's analysis, Hegel has too much history. Hegel identifies the truth with the unfolding of the absolute in history. This is fatal. In a long footnote, Kierkegaard ridicules Hegel. The latter's absolute system is not unchanging truth. It is chaotic skepticism. Since for Hegel, truth is a continuing world process, each stage is valid. I don't like the word valid there, but that was the word he used, and so I used his words. The opinions of every age are true at the moment, but since history still continues, no thinker or culture has arrived at the final truth. What is true today will be false tomorrow. In Hegel, everything is as relative as it was in Protagoras. The ridicule of this footnote does not depend on Kierkegaard's rejection of relativism. For him, too, in the footnote on the following page, 
the infinite reflection in which alone the concern of the subject for his eternal happiness can realize itself, has in general one distinguishing mark, the omnipresence of the dialectical. That means you turn from one concept to another, to another, but unlike Hegel, you never get to the end, as will be clear, I guess, in the following paragraph. Even the mo this is still the quotation, isn't it? Yeah. Even the most fixed of things, an infinite negative resolve, the infinite form of God's presence in the individual at once becomes dialectical. As soon as I take the dialectical away, I become superstitious. But it is far more comfortable to be objective and superstitious and boastful about it, proclaiming the thoughtlessness as wisdom. Thus Kierkegaard is as dialectical, as relativistic, and as skeptical as he believes Hegel is. The ridicule consists in this. Hegel thought he was objective. Kierkegaard openly accepts irrationalism. This concludes Dr. Clark's lecture entitled Religious Experientialism and Irrationalism.